rocket stoves for hot water, electricity, and more. The extreme heat created by rocket stoves can be harnessed in many ways. Heating a home, cooking food, heating water, metal smithing, glass blowing, or even making steam. Even waste disposal plants are using J-tube style designs to cleanly burn waste. Building steam is definitely the most dangerous application of rocket stove technology since it can explode and be fatal to anyone nearby. Water heaters need to have steam releases like a tempering valve and they also need to mix the hot water with cold water to guarantee it is within tolerable temperature ranges. The biggest hurdle for many who desire a rocket mass heater with uniform readouts is that every rocket stove layout, layout space, time of year, type of wood, or style of loading that wood will differ, and any metrics taken from different systems or even the same system with different wood, different times of year, or a different person lighting it, and you will get variable levels of heat, which equates to varying levels of smoke in the exhaust. Rocket stoves and rocket mass heaters in general are each unique in their effectiveness at burning cleanly and heating a space. Using a rocket mass heater or a rocket stove requires a person to be present and monitoring its operation carefully. It also takes knowledge of fire and the physics of the rocket mass heater itself. Rocket stoves have limitless potential. There are already miniature wood burning stoves that charge cell phones. Once we embrace this technology ubiquitously, we will see innovation bloom as it did with the automobile and the internet. Wood burns clean at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit or 648.8 degrees Celsius, but on average most fires burn properly around 900 to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 482 to 537.7 degrees Celsius. A rocket mass heater burns around 2000 degrees Fahrenheit or 1093.3 degrees Celsius and can go as high as 4000 degrees Fahrenheit, 2204 degrees Celsius, but around 2100 degrees Fahrenheit or 1148 degrees Celsius begins creating nitric oxide. We have a pretty narrow band to clean burning. We can do some real damage if we do not think this whole thing through. We really need as a society and global community to move into the clean burning range because things can be fabricated to burn in the clean combustion range rather than going over or under. Ernie Wisner, 2016. To learn more about rocket mass heaters, consult Erica and Ernie Wisner's new book, The Rocket Mass Heater Builder's Guide. Greenhouse and Shade House Lungs. Heat rises into or out of a house and cold air falls into a house. Greenhouses on the sunny side and shade houses on the shady side helps accomplish this easily if designed properly. Humidity filters and plastic or impermeable seals between the house and the extensions are vital to stop the spread of mildew and mold. You can also have a shared thermal mass like a concrete foundation that the house and the greenhouse share to conduct the heat indoors. The same can be done inversely with the shade house. Summer sun is blocked from heating the floor of the greenhouse by deciduous vines and surrounding trees, shade cloth, and or using full ventilation and fans to shed heat. To increase the heat catchment, the concrete foundations can be extended downward with insulation on the inside edge to trap heat in the earth beneath the house. New types of greenhouses maintain their temperatures by pumping the summer's hot air into the ground through pipes with an inexpensive fan and then releasing it to heat the greenhouse during the winter. The same concept can be applied to a house as well. A solar pump positioned in the wall between the greenhouse back wall and the front wall of the house will allow easy siphoning of unwanted hot air from either area or from both with just the use of gates. Low grade geothermal heating and cooling. By routing the hot air of summer down through the earth in winter, greenhouses can heat themselves through summer. The system can be passively running constantly, or it can be a more sophisticated system monitored by a computer program. This can eliminate or greatly reduce the costs of heating and cooling a greenhouse depending on the size and sophistication of a system. Hot air is sucked out of the top of the greenhouse or any house and is routed below the surface at least a meter through a series of pipes. Running the air through pipes underground allows the earth to cool it. The air released is much cooler. The entire system is kept in motion by the single fan inside the feeding tube. 
Condensation and moisture can be problems in these systems, dehumidifying the moist, warm greenhouse air before it enters the cooler, below ground area will prevent or mitigate this, but requires a stronger fan and therefore more energy input. Otherwise, allowing water to drain by design, having the pipe slope to one corner may help as it does with air conditioning units. Root cellars. These are earth storages that range from holes in the ground to entire rooms underground to store food through the winter and to keep food cool in summer. These, like the wallapini, rely upon the thermal constant, the consistent temperature of the earth four feet below the surface. Sepp Holzer is a master builder of earthen shelters. He builds them for his animal shelters, storage, root cellars, and more. They are incredibly useful and easy to build since they are usually only the size of a room. Creating a safe, earth-covered roof for so small a structure is much easier to manage. The larger it gets, the more engineering it requires to avoid weakness in the structure. The size of root cellars should be also shored up in most cases to prevent soil cave-ins. Black soldier fly larvae and other waste insect to animal feed systems. Black soldier fly larvae are an incredible feed or supplemental feed for poultry or fish. They consist of more than 40% protein, reproduce quickly, laying 900 eggs in the five to eight days they live, and feed on decomposing kitchen waste and manure. This system turns waste into feed for animals efficiently. There are many insects that are edible and manageable that can be grown as feed. This includes fly larvae, worms, beetles, and others. Mulberry trees over ponds have silkworms falling into them, feeding the fish passively. Recognizing and listing the insects we can attract and raise that our animals can feast upon is a first step to including them in our designs. Chapter 14, Arid Climates. Arid climates are those where evaporation exceeds precipitation. Though typically we think of deserts and arid areas as being hot places, these can be both in hot and cold climates. These areas can suffer from prolonged droughts, extreme dryness, and high soil salinity. Most of the life in arid climates is beneath the surface, near the oases of moisture, nocturnal, seasonal, rain-dependent, and even migratory. These are the areas Alan Savory has dubbed brittle. Neil Speckman's 10 Keys for Greening Any Desert Know your original climate. Understanding what came before human or natural disturbances helps us plan. In historical and geological time, there have been many stable climates and ecosystems on every site. The most natural and beneficial changes we can make on site are those that mimic or encourage these past on site ecosystems. Know your water cycle. Careful water budgeting comes from understanding precipitation, understanding the water path, planning for the larger 150 year precipitation events, knowing the recharge rate of the aquifer, knowing the longest time period between rains and even understanding what is driving precipitation in the area. Know your mineral or nutrient cycle. Understanding how your nutrient cycles in your system is critical. Understanding how your nutrients cycle in your system is critical, especially in arid climates where a lack of moisture can prevent biological breakdown, essentially locking up nutrients. Find your niche in your watershed. Understanding where you are in your watershed is critical to managing water on your site. Precipitation and evaporation. Knowing how much water you get in contrast to how much water evaporates on your site gives you a much more accurate idea of what amount of precipitation you can expect to infiltrate and store. Anti-evaporation measures. Plant mulch, rock mulch, shade, perennial grasses and trees and windbreak. Converting evaporation from bare ground to evapotranspiration through plants can encourage a healthier upper water cycle. Species selection. What type of ecology is your goal? Does that fit within your water budget? Using a climate analog, locate plants and animals that will work in that ecological model. Timing. Plan your planting and earthworks around the dry and wet seasons. Both plants and animals create disturbances that can be beneficial or detrimental depending on placement, timing, and management. Creating microclimates. These smaller areas where more extreme climate features are mitigated can become stable microclimates that spread outward in fractal patterning to connect to other microclimate sites. Enabling ecological secession. 
starting with physical infiltration of water and then following that with biological infiltration of water allows for the quickest and most stable ecological secession pathway. Arid soils. Decomposition is often suspended or seasonal in the dry lands. The lack of moisture tends to preserve the nutrients in a dehydrated state. This leads to nutrient and mineral rich soils, but they can often lack organic matter, moisture, soil life, and clays, which are needed to make soil stable enough for plants to establish. Organic matter can compensate for any lack of clays, especially if aided with aggressive pioneer species legumes that fix nitrogen, but use clay if possible because it accelerates the process and increases success rates. Because rains usually occur annually or sometimes even less often, they are highly erosive events. The soils lack structure and root systems to hold them together, so they erode easily. Organic matter that is accumulated is dried out, so it is washed away easily. Precipitation. During a few brief weeks each year in summer or winter, the rains come, but drought in these regions can go on for years. Soils that dry for long periods of time can turn hydrophobic. They can repel moisture. For this reason, all deserts flood in large rain events. The severity of the floods is not just a factor of rainfall intensity, but also a factor of geography, plant density, and soil composition. What needs to happen is the slowing, spreading, and soaking of the water into the landscape. People can encourage this through physical structures such as earthworks, biological improvement, increases in soil carbon and soil life, as well as interception by trees and plant life, or chemical soil additives, though the last is not recommended. Precipitation can also be soaked in with large flat areas that can hold pacified floodwaters for deep soakage. For precipitation to occur in the desert, several things need to be overcome. The temperatures must be below the dew point. There must be cloud condensate nuclei, CCN. There must be moisture in the air. Desert dust heats up the air, reflects light at the height of the clouds, and steals moisture, preventing temperatures from reaching the dew point. Trees are the key to reversing this trend. Perennial grasses cannot go for years without rain, but trees can. Trees provide shade and CCN, lower albedo, raise evaporation rates, raise infiltration rates, and increase water vapor density. Quote, we can afforest the whole west coast of Saudi Arabia, which is about 30 million acres, or 12 million hectares, in such a way that we're going to make it rain more frequently, and at the same time create entirely new economies that don't exist now. Agricultural economies that are actually going to increase water resources and sequester carbon and increase biodiversity and biomass. Neil Speckman, Sustainable Design Masterclass, 2016. Dry land earthworks. Incredibly long swales are often used like diversion drains in flooding events, but still allow for soakage. They can concentrate precipitation into gardens, orchards, or homestead areas. Pits, gabion dams, and even check dams can be used in conjunction with earthworks to slow down waters before they enter catchment. Any earthwork that allows the water to slow down removes silt from the water. Swales are soil building and water distribution tools in the dry lands. Arranging stones for check dams, condensation traps, or even mosaics of stone mulch pit gardens all can help to create niches for desert life. It doesn't take much moisture and windbreak for the desert to begin building soil. Trees can go inside the swale bed, not on the berm only. These trees can help slow the movement of water through, and in some instances, they can also be damaged by flooding. Use native pioneer species as much as possible to protect the valuable trees in your system. Microclimates are created with sheltering earthworks, native edges, sunken garden beds, and pits. Shade from the predicted canopy tree line defines maximum distance where the next swale or row will go. The more shade, the better. The higher the canopy creating the shade, the better as well. Rain catchment swales can go for kilometers in arid climates. The Albeda project in Saudi Arabia maintains a water catchment to water usage ratio of 5 to 2 on their demo site, with plans for a 9 to 1 ratio on a 5,000 hectare site. They are putting more water into the ground than they are using to drip irrigate their trees. They are making a productive agricultural operation in an area considered unfit for agriculture while soaking in more water than they are taking out of their wells. 
canats are irrigation systems that tap into the raised water tables of hills that are above agricultural areas. Using ingenious tunnels, they tunnel directly into the water table of the hill and form a channel to draw out the water. Wells uphill from the channel outlet can dip down and get water from the channel.